All right. Well, I'm happy to see many faces I know actually. It's it's very interesting. It's like a the audience is is many people I know from very different facets, and they almost represent what I'm going to talk about. So I'm very happy in a way. That's kind of almost uh, you know uh, uh, an incarnation of that of that topic. Uh, so I'm a researcher uh, at the Learning Planet Institute, uh, and I'm also co-resident at the Bergerac uh, Hub uh, uh, of Life itself. Uh, and so I'm uh, going to show uh, some. Uh, some aspects of what I think uh, citizen science uh, and can bring to uh, the study of, uh, I would say, wisdom practices uh, or in general, uh, uh, um, self and collective practices uh, and mindful practices. Um, so what I want first to contextualize uh, is the development that there's been uh, in open communities, and you know, even actually Rufus, one of the co-founders of uh, of Life itself, has written the Open Revolution, like a book about these communities that are out of the academic system, that uh, are not necessarily in traditional institutions, and that do things together. It can be through uh, open source communities, uh, hackathons, can be open science communities, uh, and they prototype ideas together. So you have more and more of these efforts. Uh, that are done outside of institutions. Uh, and I would say it's not just outside of institutions. If you look at science itself, more and more people are working together, like articles are not co-authored by at least an average uh, seven of authors. So you have more and more of these collaborative efforts and it's created uh, this, um, I would say, movement around what has been called crowd science or citizen science or network science or massively collaborative science. So these are science that are uh, uh, conducted by um, a large diversity of people and that tend to involve what is called generic term citizen, uh, meaning someone who's not necessarily in the traditional academic setting, but can be a stakeholder or can be someone who just wishes to volunteer and help uh, a given uh, uh, cause. And it's been touch touching many fields like uh, in physics, mathematics, um, you know, uh, biology, uh, even mathematics. Uh, it tends to be uh, characterized by the fact that uh, you have uh, open participation uh, and open disclosure of what you find. So you try to uh, report a lot of what's what, what, what the findings are, what the outcomes are, and you try to be as inclusive as possible with who can participate. Uh, and uh, the, what is shown on the right, and by the way, that's a very, a very good review on that topic by Franzoni and Sauerman. What you see on the right is that uh, it's been even done for some uh, domains where you have extremely high expert skill that is needed, uh, as well as many interdependent subtasks. Uh, and that's the example of polymath which was basically a forum of people collectively, collaboratively solving a mathematical theorem together. Uh, and so these successes have, have, have you know, been interesting because many of the problems that we're uh, facing or many of the challenges, let's say, uh, that are, that are that's been summarized under the uh, sustainable development goals, many of these goals from the United Nations requires a very diverse range of stakeholders to work together uh, and they require collaborative skills uh, of the stakeholders to work together. And so you need uh, to be able to involve stakeholders and help them collaborate. So on my end for the past few years at the Learning Planet Institute, uh, I've had a lab, the Interaction Data Lab, where we studies these communities, how they work, how they organize, how they scale, how they solve together, uh, using tools from network science. Uh, so network science and network approaches uh, is just a way to represent phenomena and in particular uh, social phenomena by representing how people interact together and how people will uh, uh, share tasks together or will do projects together uh, through a network where nodes are people and, and then edges are interactions. And you can represent many things like you can represent the way community grows the way a different, a certain structure of a group will lead to a certain performance uh, of, of the network. You can look at hierarchical aspects of the network, 
whether there is a hierarchical structure or more distributed structure. You can look at the resilience of the structure where you uh, remove people or like if, if there is a high turnover, etc. And particularly what interested me was the uh, cases of the self-organized networks. So the networks of people that are self-organizing into a community, right? Uh, and so that's an example of a community that we studied in the past few years uh, that uh, we uh, developed on another platform called Just One Giant Lab. Uh, that was during COVID. And you had uh, people from uh, biology, from software development, uh, from uh, uh, hardware development, uh, and people from more like human resource or like human management uh, that work together to coordinate many projects uh, around COVID in a completely bottom-up manner. And you had emergent roles, you had uh, um, uh, uh, distributed governance systems uh, and kind of a coordination core that emerged to help that thrive. So we had uh, uh, this community and uh, yeah, maybe I, I will switch. So, so what we realized during that time is that partly uh, in, in those communities that are uh, where people come to volunteer and you had you know, even uh, high schoolers coming and retired people coming, et cetera. One of the important aspects was the fact that we were having the confrontation of a large number of perspectives. And these large number of perspectives were coming together through uh, participatory processes, uh, which involved uh, alignments uh, of, of uh, uh, different groups uh, and which involved facilitating communication. In a way, what you're doing, Nathan, is literally a lot of that, that itself is about uh, allowing for these perspectives to, to, to get, you know, encountering one another. And partly these community meetings are actually fostering that process, right? Uh, and uh, so here are some um, uh, uh, extracts and pictures from uh, uh, papers that we published with uh, Yogi actually uh, on how these processes of participation are key uh, for the citizen science and are actually as important as the outcome itself. Uh, and partly uh, they are important because uh, there's not just one way to have an outcome or one way to uh, uh, describe an objective science. There's different perspectives, and that's a pillar called perspectival realism in epistemology. And these perspectives need to uh, see each other to deliberate. So you need deliberative practices, you need forms of dialogues uh, in order to achieve outcomes that uh, represent different uh, target groups. Uh, and there is, I would say, beyond the epistemology, there's a cognitive science uh, aspect and, and, uh, to it. Uh, and here I just put some elements from uh, uh, John Verbecki's, uh, uh, I would say, uh, 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 words or like uh, descriptions of that. Uh, where participation uh, uh, and the patterns in participation are what afford what is called perspectival knowledge, right? So the knowledge of perspectives and uh, uh, and then the program Liuba, if you can mute yourself, thank you. <laughs> uh, and so taking into this account these elements of having to involve stakeholders and to have deliberative practices uh, and to allow for different perspectives to come up, uh, came this notion of extreme citizen science, which was developed by uh, Muki Hackley, uh, who's a professor at uh, uh, UCL in London uh, and also a visiting uh, professor at the Learning Planet Institute. And he developed a model of saying, uh, citizen science can be more than just having people helping with data collection, or it has to be something that is partic beyond participatory. So it is not just participating in, in the problem definition, but truly collaborating uh, on the problem definition. And so he called that extreme citizen science. And it's in his case, it's the example of uh, geography and, and map making uh, with uh, uh, local tribes. Uh, here, I think uh, it's in Congo uh, where he's got uh, uh, pygmies uh, who are uh, involved uh, in uh, tracking illegal logging. So people are truly involved in problems that they are stakeholders. Sometimes they are the only stakeholders of that problem uh, and they're getting involved to be helped maybe to make a sense out of it or to share uh, uh, data that they are truly concerned with. 
right? And which is obviously something that is interesting in the context of practices like contemplation, where you have something that is truly subjective, or that you have something that you have uh, been uh, uh, that you are uh, maybe uh, experiencing, and that you want to find ways to get involved into the problem definition that it uh, entails. Uh, and maybe just a note also to say that these uh, aspects of participation uh, have been also, and, and participation in citizen science projects uh, is, and in general in impact-driven initiatives where your stakeholder uh, has been shown also to be able to increase relational well-being, uh, meaning that it increased uh, aspects of your relation to uh, the self, to others, but also to the world as in uh, your local environment. Uh, and uh, uh, which bring to, you know, we began with this uh, question of the sustainable development goals and achieving them through collaboration. Uh, but in order to achieve them, what we're talking about is participation, it's inclusion, it's involvement of stakeholders. And this is a lot of those skills that are required uh, in what have been called the inner development goals, which is like skills of being the relation to self, thinking uh, the cognitive skills, relating to others in the world, uh, collaborating and acting for enabling change. Uh, so what we are doing at the hub is partly investigating those practices that are involved with uh, the inner development goals and exp exploring that interface between contemplative practices uh, and between how to do a science of it and how to investigate their impact uh, and how to investigate the methodology and protocols through which uh, we can better understand uh, if these practices work on how to, uh, 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 or whether it's dialog dialogical practices. Uh, uh, and so we're doing that partly through transdisciplinary residencies that we're having. So partly for having people that are whether scientists, uh, contemplatives, artists, and activists that come together around uh, a similar question, but also through having our own modus operandi of trying to enable the place to be in between a monastery and a university, what we call the mon metamodern monastery, uh, where we investigate practices, collective practices that are inspired from Zen practices uh, in order to see the effect it has on participants and particularly interested in how it can allow us to achieve perspective, uh, uh, perspectival knowing. Uh, so I'm just sharing uh, the type of, of event we had has been coming either from, I would say, uh, the more like organi organizational theory tribe. So having people that are um, practitioners of organizational change and where they are interested in the principle of collective governance. And so we had uh, uh, collective intelligence uh, residency in, in, um, in March, but also um, uh, uh, people coming from tradition of uh, psychology and contemplation. Uh, and that was um, uh, uh, a residency in March called relational embodiment, where here uh, the uh, aspect was to leverage uh, practices that are in between positive psychology and group therapy and contemplative practices in order to embody and verbalize different levels of relation to the self and to the other. Uh, and that's an example where we uh, did a little pilot of studying how this residency operate and how people then can report uh, changes based on the practices. Uh, and so we've done uh, in social interaction mapping in order to understand how the, the uh, groups were formed. So these are here all the participants with a relation and how the groups were formed. What are the different scales uh, of relation uh, that we observed with the idea that we would love to be able to do uh, 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 dynamic aspects of uh, these networks as they unfold uh, and to look in particular at uh, uh, how people can journal practices, can journal the type of uh, uh, outcome that these practices have had on them, uh, and how did it depend on the different, on the order of practices, uh, and who they interacted with during the day, etc. Uh, but we're also doing um, uh, uh, 
outcome harvesting from surveys and, and interviews in order to also uh, do text analysis on the type of um, uh, dimensions that come from the report uh, on how people get affected, uh, uh, the challenges they face with the practices, and uh, how different dimensions of the space they're in and their interactions uh, affect their uh, 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 the outcomes of practices. Uh, so these are pilots we've done on the research here, uh, but the more general uh, aspect, this type of data has been, uh, I would say, uh, like that is being collected on, on practices and on their outcome uh, has been looked also in other contexts. So if you take the context, for example, of uh, uh, people that are looking at uh, altered uh, consciousness, uh, uh, altered states of consciousness, there's an open self-research community with the Psychonaut Wiki, for example, which is a community-driven uh, initiatives where people provide reports on their states after certain practices, uh, and it's community-driven, and they have uh, 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 methods for collecting those reports, uh, and their idea is, in particular, to be able to provide evidence-based academic perspective from these reports, which is also something that you have ongoing at the Qualia Research Institute, where they're writing methods uh, to um, uh, develop self-research protocol to measure, for example, uh, in the context of, in that case, psychedelic taking, what is the valence evolution and what are the best protocols in order to uh, 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 to collect this data. So this is really like autoethnography. Uh, I will maybe skip that. Uh, but, and more generally, you also have that in the medical context uh, of symptom analysis. Symptom is this extremely subjective uh, uh uh it, it 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 is a symptom is completely subjective and so you have a um, initiative like open humans to help people who have certain rare symptoms or rare diseases be able to document and do self-research through data on what is happening both at the physiological level or at the subjective level depending on intervention and this is something that not only releases open data but also allows to published material. So you actually do a science of something that is n equal one, something that is purely self-research uh, and, and almost uh, perfectly idiosyncratic. And finally, you have self-research, but you've also had a ton of previous uh, research on the self. I would say this is an example of a, a library in an ashram uh, that we visited last year. Uh, and where you know you go around and you have all these these texts that are lost on inquiries uh, on the self, and there are uh, now open source initiatives to also look at these texts and to embed them to bring them back to text analysis in order for modern uh, people to learn from them in a quantitative manner to be able to almost actually dialogue with them also with AI now. So all that to say you have all these different initiatives that involve uh, self-research, research on practices through different manners. Uh, and we're at a state, and, and some of them involve, I would say, people with uh, contemplative practices. Uh, and uh, Liam Kavanagh, who's talking then in two sessions, uh, co-founder of Life Itself, uh, uh, made this position paper uh, with a brother Faplin from the Plum Village uh, Monastery. Uh, a few years ago, two years ago, on the fact that contemplatives themselves, in particular contemplatives from, from monasteries such as Plum Village, should be able to have a say in going to that upper part of not just collecting data, but also asking what are the questions we want to collect also when we report, when we collect data, and, and so be involved at the root upstream uh, in the loop of the research process. Uh, and so that's uh, a, a proposition we uh, uh, we take on, and we're doing a residency in September around that question to actually bring the contemplative as upstream as possible in uh, the research design for this uh, data collection analysis. And an example of the type of thing it can do, and I'm, I'm going to finish with, with that, uh, is, uh, uh, I think, a good example of bringing together uh, knowledge from contemplatives uh, and I would say the need to prototype uh, uh, deliberative practices and practices in order for driving social action. Uh, and an example of that is the youth theory from uh, the Presenting Institute, 
uh, at the MIT, uh, where you have this combination of Zen practices and social presenting theater from Arawana Hayashi, and uh, I would say uh, uh, theories of listening uh, and generative listening uh, from Otto Schammer that together allow to drive uh, co sensing uh, and uh, uh, ecosystem creation, in particular in the context of social entrepreneurs. And so we had in, uh, in the Learning Planet Institute, we had a session with uh, hundreds of uh, social entrepreneurs of the transition uh, who came together uh, uh, for uh, uh, an experiment by the Presenting Institute to enable through practices a better understanding of the relational complexity uh, involved in this social uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, so to summarize, uh, what I've shown you are, uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, a need to create frameworks to share practices and insights, in particular in the context of uh, contemplative practices, so practices uh, that uh, come from, uh, um, I would say, traditions uh, uh, that we're pursuing, uh, and a need for involving the contemplatives more upstream in those research. In, in an extreme citizen science fashion. Uh, and there are methods from science, uh, such as autoethnography or self-research uh, from quantitative, quantitative self, for example, that allow to frame also some of these uh, 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 practices and some of these uh, uh, insights into shareable, into replicable manner in order to make it something that is also robust uh, in terms of, um, of endeavor. Uh, also, one interesting thing with uh, the approach of documenting practices and documenting outcome of practices is that this experience logging itself is a form of contemplative action research in a way, because you both are integrating experiences as you document it. So you're actually doing it as a practice. So the experience logging is itself a practice, uh, but it also allows for doing causal analysis as you do it in time. So it's proposing kind of a, a, a practice in the loop in a way, <laughs> like the documentation is itself a practice that is part of the contemplative process. Uh, and what we're aiming, and that's, I would say, almost a research agenda, partly of the, also the life itself research as a whole, is how you can form a new epistemology for a metamodern science by involving also some of these practices. Uh, and partly, partly the appreciation of diverse forms of knowing, so not just propositional knowing, not just you know the 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 the, the uh, proposition, the theory, but also the participatory knowing, uh, and in particular through embodied practices. And partly, I've shown you uh, uh, dialogical practices. Uh, also, some inquiry methods that can come from contemplatives uh, into like uh, the method itself of inquiry. Uh, but also the fact of providing certain containers that allow also to have practices for emergence uh, for how you have certain questions that can emerge. Uh, and so we're going to dive more into that in September on site at the hub. Uh, so you're also welcome to come and we're really looking. So we already have a few contemplatives signed up actually, uh, but so we're looking forward for if others want to join uh, and uh, and share. So that's it for me. I was five minutes more, I think. So, uh, yes. Thank, Thank you, you, Mark. That was uh, fantastic. And um, yeah, quickly before we move on, and I think as we have uh, quite a few people here, if you wanna put your hands up to ask any questions, uh, and then we can go through in a kind of structured manner. Um, I think for now, I also want to share, you know, the the residencies at the Life of Self Harbor happening pretty much back to back. Am I right, Mark? It's yes, yeah. yeah. So, um, and what what do we have coming up next? Because we have this in September, but before that, yes. Yeah, so in July, we have emergent dialogues. Um, so uh, we have. Uh, a one so a 10 days intensive that is already fully booked but followed after that uh, by uh, uh, residencies for another 10 days um, so it's going to be in July and so it's going to be uh, at least the intensive will be a lot of meditation and those practices called emergent dialogue 
um, that I think there's a podcast actually on that. Uh, that's uh, 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 an interview for one year ago. And uh, in uh, August, uh, we're going to have a gathering organized by the Respond Network. Uh, and we're going to have, in particular, a lot of scholars uh, such as Nora Bateson uh, or Jan Vaveki coming uh, to the hub. Uh, and so that's going to be partly a, a gathering, but also a practices uh, that are going to be um, uh, practices from the Respond Network that are going to be shared. Uh, after that, in September, we have contemplative citizen sciences. And uh, in October, we're opening a long-term residency format. So we're opening the hub for longer stays, for three to six months, for people who want to become core residents. Uh, and so we're also doing an announcement in the newsletter that I think is this week uh, about the program. So, yeah. Awesome. Does anyone have any any questions? I have a few, but I'll just wait to see. Yeah, go ahead, Kerry. Yeah, on one of your slides, there was a picture and it had uh, a graph of like all these people coming together and it said something about wicked problems. I wonder if you knew mm. what I was talking about. I was curious what the term wicked problems was. Yes, so I think it originally, uh, wicked problems have been uh, so i think i've heard the first time of wicked problems in the context of uh, design uh, and architecture at least it was my uh, entry point in it uh, wicked problem are this uh, intersection where you have problems that have no clear solution uh, unforeseen outcomes uh, that can involve changing behaviors that are interdependent, multi-causal, socially complex. So they tend to be these problems that other phrasing could be maybe a, a complex, <laughs> you know, that you encounter in complex systems. Uh, so there are problems that are that will involve many different stakeholders uh, that can involve maybe uh, typically uh, you will need to have at the table uh, economists, social scientists, maybe behavioral uh, uh, scientists, you will have uh, well, I, I, I guess COVID regulation was an example of that, right? Uh, and so there are problems that require the ability of very different disciplines uh, to talk to each other and the ability to also um, uh, represent uh, multiple scales. Uh, an example of, of um, practices, for example, that are interested in, in, in those problems, uh, I think the practice of social presenting uh, theater uh, from Ahawana Ayashi is an example uh, of a practice where, for example, people embody for theater and the state, uh, the school, um, the underrepresented uh, groups, uh, um, uh, uh, AI, etc., and then try to act as this um, institution or as this persona in order to embody relations that can be very complex to realize the interdependence to realize that you can have different position in that system and to realize that basically there's and, and then that you can move and change uh, the time so there are practice to embody these wicked problems to 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 feel and to to embody what are these scales at play uh but so yeah i don't know if it's uh something that's uh Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Isabella, do you, do you have a question? Hi there. Um, yeah, thanks so much for that talk. That was just mind blowing. Um, so yeah, I hope to see some of the slides later to recap on some of that information because there, there was a lot to take in. Um, but yeah, I'm doing research now on collective intelligence and how that can enhance democracy. So yeah, tapping into AI. Um, which is why I joined this talk. It's super interesting because I think, you know, often forgotten in that space, but something I'm really interested in is that sort of meditative aspect, contemplation, et cetera. So I love that you've mm -hmm. kind of marred that and the science together. Um, so my question's around how have you tied together? Because initially we're talking about participation and collaboration and, you know, between groups of people, et cetera. But then I think later on in the slides, 
-hmm. it then start to focus on our sort of like inner meditative practices and maybe like our own individual realizations so just how are we tying together sort of yeah like collective meaning mm. formation as well as our own individual realizations mm. yeah uh, it's fantastic and i'm really uh, are, are you done sorry with the question yeah uh first i'm really happy to to learn about uh, <laughs> uh about what you're doing like uh that sounds that sounds great uh and and also i will share the slides uh uh, on maybe if you're in the WhatsApp group, uh, uh, I can just share there uh, so that it's easy. Uh, so yeah, there. Uh, I think uh, so in the collective intelligence setting. So when you work, especially with uh, practitioners uh, that facilitate such events, uh, so a lot of the facilitation of collective intelligence will requires um, I would will require uh, certain practices that will be. Uh, about helping also people increase on their listening skills uh, or learn to do active generative listening uh, or uh, um, learn to uh, to be able to share also or to be able to see that they don't share or to be able to feel that others don't share or to be able to see the projection when they feel that others don't share so collective intelligence the network of interaction that is built during the processes to allow people to increase their collective intelligence in order to facilitate the buildup of that network. Uh, at the root, there's the ability either to have a very good facilitators that can do that, or at some point to be able to transmit that knowledge for people to self-facilitate into collectives that can then self-organize in very efficient way and flow, right? Uh, so that's actually a, a lot what you do in certain collective sports, where what you train, you train the collective to flow by training them to learn very fast, cues to, to read their own cognitive models and to very uh, fast understand what they want. The thing with sport is that the problem at hand is very always the same. So you can train to that. The real life is that the problem always change and you need also to have governance questions of like how you can you know, change, et cetera. So it involves things that are complex uh, at also the self level of understanding your boundaries, what are your boundaries, yourself versus the collective, and also how comfortable are you are with governance, uh, what is the share in you of the autocrat that also you don't necessarily want to see that other can reproject back on you and how you learn these things. And so what I realized working with first a lot of collective intelligence practitioners, but more and more with uh, people such as Boaz Feldman, for example, doing the relational embodiment or people from like uh, the youth theory and the presencing uh, uh, social theater or like the presencing institute, is that practices that allow first to go back to yourself, allow to see in you um, uh, or to see in you the some aspects that you can sometimes hide or some shadows that you can hide uh, or uh, don't see in the projection you have to the other. So there's something about these practices that allow to remove more and more some priors or some construct you have not only to the others but also to yourself and that allows to be in position where you can become resilient to some of the um, uh, i would say load you can have or to become more of an observer of how you are in the group and more the observer of how the group begin to be without it stopping you from acting in the group uh, so for example the practice of boas i find it very interesting because it's a practice that try to go at the multi-scale nature of the relational. You have a relational in yourself with your shadow, with yourself, with, with your constellation, right? You have a relation with other, with your particular, uh, you know, with uh, your relation, with uh, your a significant other, et cetera. And you have a relation to society, to the world, right? And all that are different scales with whom you have relation. And what uh, Boaz works on is how you make practices that go from the relation in you with your selves, right? The relation in a small group, uh, your little community, right? And the relation with the whole. And what they're doing is letting emerge, letting people say aloud, verbalize, letting them feel, or young them to feel and to verbalize what they actually uh, uh, denote in the space. So it's not about problem solving, it's about like, what are we relating on right now? And through that process, it's very in interesting and transformative because you realize all the construct and all the projection you have in the way you handle relation. And through that process, 
then you realize that it scales because suddenly you're able, when thinking about societal change, you're able to see the part that is also the projection that you saw at the micro phenomenological level of your relation to the self or to the other. And so there's something about the scale, for the scale up to happen, you need first to scale down and realize the bunch of projection you have in order for you know, not bringing them in, 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 the, in the fight in the scale up. So that, that's, that's what I ended up realizing. And so that's, that's kind of where the, the knowledge of how to participate, the knowledge of the, of the textures, the, the practices of participation is important. Because we, we dream about the big, big distributed network, et cetera, until suddenly we realize we, we recreated a beast that itself has some ego again and has some problem relating to the other beast that we created. And so it's kind of like taking that from the roots up, all right? Thanks so much, Mark. Yeah, super interesting. Thank you. I wonder if there is a study linking like that self-meditation practice to how we show up in those groups, but yeah, maybe we can talk about that later, yeah. And it's a very good question. Uh, I actually, when I discussed with the Presencing Institute, because they're doing these practices and they're really working with entrepreneurs and working at MIT with innovators, et cetera. Uh, basically all of them is like, they have intuitive knowledge that it worked. They have met people that said it got me transformed and you have these traces, but you don't have proper, I would say, protocols that would go for that and particularly because it's hard to do a b testing as well it's hard to do control case because what do you do as a control just put like 100 entrepreneurs in a room with nothing <laughs> so it's a bit actually it requires a, also a design uh scientific design of that uh, but I'd, I'd love to discuss more if also you're interested do you know if there's any work done around um <clears throat> vipassana mark because that's kind of like a very clear cut, you know, 10 days of silence. So you could do like a before and after of, of that effect. Um, yeah, so on, I, I think on, on mindfulness practices, uh, and you, you have a lot of work done, I would say, uh, on, on looking at the impact. So there's, a caveat, there's, so there's a caveat often in these studies that the effect is not necessarily big, because there's a self-selection bias that people that tend to go for these retreats or that tend to go for doing meditation in the first place, they have already placed themselves in a, in a, in a framing where they're already transformed before they get transformed in a way, right? So there's something that is kind of a, a selection bias that you have. And so if you put a bunch of random people without you know, any onboarding into that, it's as if you were, you know, I put you in a PhD of string theory, but I didn't do the undergrad and the master and you didn't have the passion for it at any rate. And so there's something about it that can be a, a, some selection bias. And, and so, 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 so that's the thing with Vipassana. What we're trying to set up with um, uh, Boas Feldman, uh, so he's not actually officially, he's an associate researcher in life itself, actually, officially. Uh, he's just started to work in life itself. What we're trying to do is to do that. He has these nice groups, um, uh, uh, that they have um, uh, online. Uh, and so they have regular groups where they're doing these resiliency circles. And here the groups are relatively diverse. Uh, and there are people that don't necessarily have prior experience also about the practices uh, and that get exposed somehow the first time. And so that, that's something here we're trying to set as a protocol for doing measurement and longitudinal studies and six months post uh, studies. Uh, for looking at the effect. And we're also trying to set up with him in the context of residencies, uh, protocols for logging in time uh, what practices people have done and how that had an effect and logging the impact also in the longer term. Uh, I would say that gets closer to things that have been done in the context, for example, of Burning Man, where there's been uh, studies on the short and long-term impacts that gatherings uh, with sharing some of these philosophies, I would say, of self-organization and of um, uh, trust-based interaction and uh, individual accountability. Uh, there's been studies showing the impact it had uh, in the short and long term on pro-social behavior uh, of people in that context. Yeah, I definitely hear that about the caveats of uh people already seeking the transformation when they arrive to these kind of mindfulness practices. 
And uh, part of the reason I mentioned Vipassana is because actually throughout India, it's been integrated into prisons without mm. any kind of prior experience. They've just, you know, the government decided, okay, we're going to teach Vipassana to these prisoners. And I think there's literature around that. I don't know how much research um, was done, but it's definitely an interesting subject. Yeah. And I, and I think, so, so it's partly it's here we're talking about the part of uh, the practice itself and, and how effective a practice is, or at least what kind of qualitative, um, what kind of quality, what kind of experience you can have with the practice or how it can uh, uh, Allow even a group to be, to perform better, but that's something also that I think is important, and I'd love also to to I don't know if if if, if uh, others have experience on that, but something that is also lacking is what kind of protocol you have to engage people whose expertise is in self inquiry, like contemplatives, uh, like you go to the Plum Village Monastery and you have people who have 20, 30 years of experience with practices and with where it led. And how, what does it mean to bring that also up to the context of objectifying that, you know? And so there's an aspect to it, which is kind of, a, 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 which has been attempted a bit by mind and life, but somehow didn't go really further, which has been attempted by Varela, which is bringing as upstream as possible uh, people who are kind of uh, stakeholders of self-research, like that, that, that they have, seen that and they have been in monasteries where they're looking at how groups can operate in a place where they live together right and which is why also we try to have here this aspect between the monastery and the university where you also try to understand how does these frames for example uh, that we have in something akin to a monastery how does this framing uh, change the posture change the way people navigate their relation change the way they 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 Change, change the nature of, of, of some of the topics that will get discussed, change the nature, how you can actually uh, interact differently. So there's something that we're interested in as well is this knowledge from monastics and from contemplatives back, feeding that back into uh, practices of, 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 of social practices, like collective practices as well. Hmm. Yeah, so I hear what, what you're saying is more like bringing in the science from the the ones that have already the deeper insight as well yeah yeah absolutely and and uh and i think it's 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 it brings very interesting questions so 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 you know i mean obviously because there's there's, there's uh, if you take the, the buddhist traditions there is for example uh, some insight on suffering or some methods that they have uh for that, so that would say there's practicalities uh, uh, from there, uh, but it it brings a question also that I think for the science is, is interesting. It's like the science of experience is how do you document uh, internal states, uh, and that's why I find it fascinating that there's also these open communities for the past fifteen years that have also tried to document, in particular in the context of, of um, psychedelics, that have tried to document the altered state. Like, what does it mean to do, to document qualitative? Uh, 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 subjective level uh, 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 aspects. So not just the outcome uh, in terms of uh, directly that could be measured uh, the social outcome, but also the subjective outcome, the felt nature, so the experience, right? And I think that's also something that is an interesting challenge for the uh, data-driven aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, we're coming near to the close of the call, but we could have a last few. Yeah, it's, thank you, Mark. It's it's not a question, but I was uh, impressed and very excited by the what I feel is a radical move in the studying of all those uh, inner practices. Um, if uh, you science is open to reconsider even the question and reconsider even why they're studying. Uh, I'm saying that because I feel that we are trapped 
in um, still in a performative uh, paradigm where even with uh, ISG, the goal seems to be to find the recipe to be happy. But what if uh, happiness was out of the subject in another paradigm? And what is freedom rather than happiness was the core question, which is explored more uh, and for centuries, years by the contemplative. So I feel that it's, uh, you, you, you mentioned a lot about the protocol, the design, the, the way to document and how the way to document can be a practice also of that or letting uh, scientific discover their question. But I feel also very, very uh, revolutionary to, to, yeah, to find a way to integrate the deconstruction of why even we're studying. And what do we want to get out from? Because we don't even know, I feel. Mm. Yeah, I feel it's, it's more a, a comment than a question, actually, because uh... <laughs> it's like- No, but I mean, as a question, I'm, I will be very, very curious to, yeah. to, to, to follow the, the, the project uh, because I feel if there is something very big and deep as so a culture, as a new culture building. And I, I, I think, so Valeria, I'm very uh, touched by this remark. I think it has a lot of value and I think it, it comes also because I know you have a strong uh, contemplative background, right? Because you've been, you know, for 12 years in Zen monasteries and you have the tensor practice. I'm just kind of reintroducing to the other people around. Um, but just to say that you're an example of someone, for example, at the hub who's got this contemplative approach. And so what you're bringing here is interesting because that's what I've seen in a way uh, done at, by the Presenting Institute, which is not for scientists, but for um, entrepreneurs. And that's interesting entrepreneurs, because when you want to change the world, there's always a part also that's, that's something you need to look in yourself, which is why do you want to change the world? There's this contemplative activism question, which is like, do you want to change the world or do you want to change yourself, right? And, and, and how do you observe like the construct that you have um, and, and, and the projection you have? And so a lot of the practices was, Basically, it's about not the not not answering a question, but answering the framing, right? And and that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is not about uh, using intelligence to answer a question. It's using intelligence to answer a framing, which is what is the framing for which uh, you can kind of um, ask good questions, right? Uh, and so there's this really nice book actually on personal wisdom, where they talk a lot about practices in order to be able for people to achieve. A better framing and that's what they call uh, uh, wisdom uh, and particular perspectival knowing in that context is the form of knowing that knows about the framing right uh, and so propositional once you have the framing then you can go with theories etc uh, and so I, I think this is exactly the kind of um, I would say insights or the kind of uh, knowledge or practices that contemplative can bring because what contemplative bring as much as uh, science has brought an observer to the world, contemplative have brought an observer to the observer, right? And that is basically something that I think is interesting, especially in the post postmodern era where we deconstruct the observer and now we need to reconstruct something, right? And there's a metamodern observer, which is the observer observing the observer. And you want to have forms, uh, I would say, of uh, uh, science that can uh, in involve uh, this novel form of observing. Uh, and so for me, these are like when I see practices like emergent dialogue we're having in July, this is, you know, eight hours of meditation to go for one hour of emergent dialogue, right? And what does it do when you do that? I mean, I guess it's been 2000 years we haven't done these things, you know? <laughs> so it's hard to kind of go again at it. But uh, yeah. All right, I think that's a great place to to end. I think we could probably go on further with this, and uh, I hope people will join us at the uh, the gathering in September to be able to dive deeper into this this uh, these ideas, these concepts. Um, yeah. So before we close, I just want to say, you know, we would love to have all of you come back and you know do a presentation, speak about what is alive in you. Um, because that's how we build this community, right? By sharing the ideas that we're passionate about and um, the projects that we're working on. So if any of you would like to, if you're in the WhatsApp chat, uh, I'm going to post the link now in case you aren't. 
yeah come and join us you can you can either message me um i'm one of the admins in the whatsapp chat and yeah we can set a time so we're doing this twice a month so there's plenty of space to kind of share and and yeah build community together so yeah once again mark thank you so much for for sharing and uh i hope to see you all soon thank you thank you all for joining thank you